And next we have Dr. Tiana Uchaz um, from Texas A&M University, who will speak with four uh, graduate students who are interested in digital art history in different ways. And were kind enough to answer the questionnaire that Dr. Uchaz sent out um, on behalf of the symposium in the spring to a large number of recipients. And she did report on the results of that survey um, in the October 15th symposium. So you can see her lecture there. I believe it's maybe posted or just about to be posted in the next week or two. So thank you very much. Thank you, Louisa. And thank you to our four participants today. I'm so excited to be able to hear from Elizabeth Burnick, Nick Mulse, Reagan Martin, and Liron Efrat, um, all of whom are up and coming researchers. And we are just thrilled that they um, that they responded to the informal survey that we sent around that Louisa mentioned uh, early in the spring to just gauge um, the questions that were driving the field in relation to digital art history and kind of expansion of technologies uh, into our, our respective subfields. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, asking Elizabeth Burnick to introduce herself briefly and to answer the question of how have technological advances changed the way you approach traditional art historical research problems? Um, thank you, and I want to thank MoMA and the Frick also for organizing this and for inviting me to share my research with you. Um, I am, uh, my name is Elizabeth Bernick, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of the History of Art at Johns Hopkins University, where I'm completing my dissertation on the itinerant artist Cesare da Sesto and his sketchbook. Cesare lived from 1477 to 1523, uh, very little is known about his life or the exact timing and order of his commissions in Milan, Rome, Naples, and Messina. Throughout his travels, uh, he compiled and used a remarkable sketchbook, one of the only of its kind to survive, and our, it is our main source for reconstructing his career. The core of the uh, long dismembered sketchbook, 26 folios, is today held at the Morgan Library and Museum. And during my time as a Samuel H. Crest Predoctoral Fellow in the Morgan's Drawing Institute, I had the rare privilege to study Cesare's drawings on a daily basis. And that much close contact inevitably started to raise questions about materiality and facture. The main question I wanted to answer was, did these drawings once actually constitute a sketchbook and why does this matter? Um, my doctoral training thus far though, had taught me nothing about the, uh, the history, the materiality or conservation of paper. So luckily, the Morgan has one of the best paper conservation um, centers in the world, and Reba Snyder, one of the Morgan's lead conservators, kindly taught me about how Renaissance paper was made and what kind of evidence this facture leaves behind for us to study today. Most importantly, she taught me what chain lines are. Um, as you can see here, chain lines are the vertical lines often easily visible on Renaissance paper if held up to a light source although here they have been further enhanced to, to make them very visible. They are the faint impressions left by the wire sieve on which the pulp mixture was left to dry. Uh, Reba encouraged me to reach out to Rick Johnson, who as many of you are aware is a computer engineer at Cornell, who has developed software that can so precisely measure uh, the distance between chain lines and their overall orientation on the, on the sheet of paper that it is possible to determine if two pieces of paper were once mold mates, that is made on similar, but because handmade, not exactly the same molds by the same paper maker. Um, armed with this new material and technical knowledge, I was able to determine by taking high resolution transmitted light photographs of the paper and measuring the chain lines that Chase that I really did make and use his drawings as a sketchbook. As the distances between the chain lines were consistent across all the folios. Here you can see I've kind of roughly lined up the, the chain lines on, on several different folios to give you an idea of how they were all made on the same mold. Um, I was even able to determine the original size of the larger sh uh, sheet from which Chesede cut his folios. That is, I know that he was using a royal sheet and then he made what are known as octavos by cutting it into eight pieces there. Um, by measuring the chain lines on drawings by Chesede now scattered across other collections, I was also able to add 10 new drawings to the sketchbook or return, you know, 10 drawings to the sketchbook. Here I show uh, three examples. Chain line evidence also helped me form a new hypothesis 
about the sketchbook's early provenance. So without this combination of good old fashioned close looking and new technological advances, I would not have been able to reconstruct Chase Day's sketchbook. Um, and I'll just close by saying for anyone who'd like some more information, especially about the technical aspects of this, I did publish these findings in an article in the summer 2019 volume of Master Drawings. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, and now we'll turn to our second presenter, and that is Nick Moles. And he's going to talk to us about his research, and of course, he'll introduce himself as well. Hey, thank you, Tiana, so much uh, for this opportunity. I will just share my screen and hope that works. Um, so I am Nick, a PhD candidate at the University of Edinburgh, uh, and I look mostly into the mathematical and global influence of the painter and architect Sebastiano Serlio by combining conventional arts uh, history research with 3D scanning and computer-aided design. So in this uh, presentation, I will basically only raise questions which stem from um, digital applications for investigating historical lines, drawings, and vectors. And the line as a mathematical unit became one of the building stones of Renaissance uh, theory, uh, where architects and artists like Leon Battista Alberti, Albrecht Dürer, or Sebastiano Serlio uh, devised their line theories, of course. And they combine points, lines, and planes as constellations of vertices to translate concepts into tangible drawings, forming the basis of what would become the vectoral and Cartesian coordinate system in digital computation. So there is a, an immediate link between the representation and uh, what I'm, of course, doing methodologically. Now, during, um, uh, sorry, the, the image here shown uh, is a Renaissance design from Salio from uh, 1551, originally created through silography. However, the process of the digital reproduction presents the image in a skeuomorphic manner, being an intangible material metaphor of its tangible paper original, making it ontologically different from the original print. And here, the 3D scan addresses the issues of the digital copy, reproduction, creation, and it computes its own reality uh, as it can be observed, yet not touched, and is only apprehensible in motion, as you can see, uh, very much unlike the original uh, early modern print. And during the data capturing process, um, the scanner emits its multispectral gaze, protruding, peeling, and scraping data from the surface, surface of the object, transmitting formerly unperceivable and unexplored data which remained hidden to the human eye. So the resulting point cloud outputs as encoded data sets allow algorithmic altering in which we can extract the now virtual ink uh, of the virtual paper by applying scalar fields, uh, which you can see in color, in point cloud processing software. The scalar registers topological deviations of the paper with an accuracy up to 50 micrometer, which is 0.05 millimeters and observes the paper folds and curvature, its grain, its flaws, and the ink. And as seen as on, on screen, the ink can be extracted and allows uh, selecting the data's magnitude or elevation height, which visualizes information uh, unperceivable to the human body. So um, the ink then, um, the, the ink or the lines then uh, allow transposing uh, the 3D scan into CAD programs as loci, which you can see on the right-hand side, allowing the reconstruction of the drawing. And since the scanned point distance reaches micro accuracy, the digital reproduction allows a refinement of the image in a way the original object could not depict due to the mechanical limitations of silograph technology. My forensic method of drawing history discerns process of, uh, processes of architectural creation by uh, anatomizing uh, the hidden vectors that are embedded within architectural representations. And the resulting drawing um, digitally copies historic in, uh, a historic image and allows dismembering architectural proportions to investigate drawing processes and morphologies, transcending the boundary of analysis and creation, which is of course only possible through uh, digital technology. And uh, the point I want to make is throughout the history of drawing the line or the vector, uh, form the basis for devising images and still manifest in present-day vector data resulting from 3D scans. The vector forms an unaltered code whereby 3D scanning acts as a bionic extension of the human body in which the light ray replaces the human eye in a similar way the pen formed the technological extension to the body of the medieval scribe or the silograph to the Renaissance master. 
And uh, in conclusion, 3D scanning does allow us to refine the accuracy of uh, historical drawings in representative ontological or epistemological terms, raising questions on convention versus invention, method versus tool, and creative versus uh, analytical. And uh, on that note, I would like to end with an open question. So thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, we're now going to turn to um, Reagan Martin from um, the University of Michigan. And I'll invite you to introduce yourself and of course to answer how have technological advances changed the way that you approach traditional art historical research problems? Great, thank you so much. Um, I'll just share my screen with you. Oops, sorry about that. Let's go back. Okay, so my name is Reagan Martin and I'm a PhD candidate in the history of art at the University of Michigan. And I'm currently the Samuel Crest Institutional Fellow at the Warburg in London. Uh, my dissertation focuses on the earliest printed books, books printed with movable type in Venice. And Venice was the first uh, city state to offer legal protections known as print privileges, which are somewhat akin to modern day copyright. So I wanted to approach this body of legal documents as data and apply data visualization software and techniques to see what I could extract from them. Uh, I'm not the first person to have had this idea. The director of the Archivio di Stato in Venice in the 19th century also created summaries of the print privileges. Uh, and here I have an example for you. While some of them are greatly detailed, others of them he leaves out uh, very important evidence. So for example, this one finishes by him summarizing, they obtain the usual privilege with the usual sanctions, but doesn't offer the definition of what the usual privilege is, so it leaves some gaps in our data collection. So my first step was to go to the archive to fill those gaps um, and to find out that here is the privilege and in fact um, it's the title was protected for a period of 10 years and there was a fine associated with uh, any counterfeits of that text of 10 ducats or 10 ducati. So then I was able to organize um, the 212 privileges from my period of investigation into a spreadsheet or CSV. Um, I assigned unique IDs to each one of them, partially created from their location in the archive, and then was able to pull out other information, some of it very obvious, such as the date that it was issued, the duration, the beneficiaries, and then some of it less obvious that only emerged as it was organized into this spreadsheet. Um, the fines are often distributed to many different parties. So once I saw that all organized in front of me, I was able to compare how the distribution structures of fines started to break down. Um, once I had my CSV, I first just uh, sort of plugged it into a simple graph. Previous scholars of these documents who are looking at them sort of one off or only as they apply to specific prints have dismissed them as uh, not having any inherent logic and not really representing any useful data. Um, but the graph here, I feel fairly confident in arguing that we see periods of um, sort of uncertainty at the beginning and end of this period. And then we see a rather normal or um, almost biological rise and fall in the, in the fines associated with counterfeit uh, texts. So in fact, we do start to see a clearer picture emerging. And then I also use the data visualization software Tableau. And this is just one example of information that I was able to pull out. Um, but I wanted to see, for example, are the print privileges associated with certain types of professions over others? So as you might expect, the most common one is printer. And the next one is null because um, these are not standardized forms. They often simply don't list um, the profession. But other more interesting information does emerge, such as the fact that singers or cantore in the Basilica San Marco represent a fairly large category of profession that received print privileges. So as you can see, this isn't immediately visual. And this is sort of my challenge in taking a body of data and then using data visualization and then applying it to art historical research. But what it has done is it's helped me to know what to look for and to know sort of how to look at that. So for example, sort of counterintuitive, um, some of the texts that receive the highest terms in the privileges are astronomical and mathematical texts 
while some that received the lowest are religious texts. So knowing how they were uh, prioritized or privileged in their own time helps me consider where to look for visual elaboration and representation. Um, so that's a very quick uh, rundown and I'd be happy to entertain questions later. Wonderful, thank you so much, Reagan. And our last presenter is Liron Efra from the University of Toronto and I'll let her again introduce herself and tell us about her research. Hi everyone, um, thank you Tiana for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Dewan Flat, and I'm currently completing my PhD at the Department of Art History at the University of Toronto. Uh, my research focuses on mapping different forms of augmented reality applications in cultural context, um, including museum augmented reality apps and apps for heritage sites. Basically, uh, I'm interested in how augmented reality can be used to reconstruct the user experience of cultural heritage, content, and sites. So to identify some of the common ways that augmented reality is used by cultural institutions, I have collected uh, 60 augmented reality apps, so some sort of uh, pool of examples, and I've used comparative method to map 12 categories of augmented reality apps. So some of these categories uh, are described uh, in related publications that I authored, um, but uh, to better illustrate this typology and also to make these categories more accessible, uh, I have uh, created CHAR, uh, an online collective, uh, an online collection, sorry, of cultural heritage AR apps, um, in which I've indexed uh, my data for um, these augmented reality projects that I've collected. So I guess this is the time for me to share my screen. Uh, let me see. There we go. All right. So I hope um, that you guys can see that. Um, so basically what we see here, um, this is uh, my collection. It currently contains 60 objects. Um, this is still a work in progress. And basically what we can see here is the collection description. And these are the categories. These are clickable as well. And we can scroll down to see all the objects in the collection. And in this collection, basically uh, objects can be browsed uh, individually and also according to uh, their categories. So for example, if we click on one, we can see all the objects under this category. Um, and if we will enter into a specific entry, for some reason, oh, here we go, it's loading. Uh, we can see all the metadata that uh, relates to this particular entry. Um, and I also include some bibliography here um, with um, specific information related um, to each um, entry. So the purpose of this uh, collection is basically to inspire us to um, combine those categories and further expand the use of the technology in cultural context and also to expose project leaders to some of the ideology that might be associated with their apps and to connect between um, the theory and practice of new media in the field of cultural heritage uh, augmented reality and going back to the question of sorry, going back to the question of how digital tools can help us reconsider art historical questions, then my response to this would be that we must also consider today how digital tools are used um, to make art and heritage accessible. So in many instances, from virtual exhibitions to augmented reality apps, and especially now the time of COVID, unfortunately, we only experience art by means of digital mediation. So while questions around spectatorship and the spectator um, have been around for decades, um, art historians who considered similar questions in the past, like Michael Fried or Claire Bishop, for example, have focused mostly on aspects related to audience, audience and artwork interactivity and interconnectivity. So today we may want to ask um, not only how viewers um, sorry, how viewers become participants in an artwork settings, uh, but also how institutions, organizations, and individuals and artists uh, employ these technologies to retell existing and alternative stories by means of digitizing and recurating art and heritage. So in a way, the digitization of art and heritage exceeds being a process of documentation or preservation. Um, and it is not only an emancipation of the artwork from its aura, 
um, to paraphrase Benjamin. Um, I think this has become a creative process that involves the re-curating of materials in an interactive way um, and also makes us reconsider what can be interpreted as either art or heritage. So I am happy to also uh, show some more features of this uh, collection at the Q&A, but with that, I'll end my presentation and I thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all four of you. Um, so I would invite you all to unmute at this point. And we're going to take five minutes now um, and just consider uh, one question for our roundtable discussion um, before we move on to the more formal Q&A session that will open up to, to all participants from today's symposium. And so the question that I want to pose to you is, what art historical research topics and questions do you think are best suited to computational tools and methods, but that have not yet been explored by these techniques. Do I have any volunteers to raise your metaphoric hand? And um, I can jump in. Thanks. It's not, of course, something I've totally come up with on my own. And luckily some very smart people are already working on this, but for someone that, like me who works on prints and drawings, of course, I talked about chain lines which are on all paper, um, but watermarks are more commonly and widely studied and kind of recognized to be a very useful tool in just learning more information about a piece of paper. But um, I would just say that you'd be surprised how many um, pieces of paper now in various museum collections don't have watermarks, which is why, you know, we, I think it is interesting and important to fall back on chain lines sometimes. But Anyways, I just think like the system for museums and private collectors, everyone to just more systematically um, photo make the kinds of photographs um, that we need to study the watermarks to um, then make those available to the public in, in searchable databases. I know this is something Rick Johnson is also working on, ways that we can now so precisely um, photograph the watermarks that we can measure them, that we can just be a lot more precise about saying this watermark is like this other watermark, comparing them and making these publicly available searchable um, databases because you'd be surprised even for, you know, an artist as famous and well-studied as Leonardo da Vinci, there is no systematic study um, or database of his watermarks. And I think it would really help us to better understand and deepen our knowledge of, um, of Renaissance paper if that was available. Great, thanks. And actually, given that Nick, you also work so closely with works on paper, I wonder if you have anything to, to add to what Elizabeth has said or, or another direction that you think we should also consider. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what Elizabeth said is, uh, is fantastic. I totally agree with that. Uh, and to that, we can immediately add, um, it would be very helpful to start cataloging um, remote sensing data. So again, these are scripts that you can have. Uh, you upload them and you can have a remote sensing software um, running in, on your laptop or whatever. Um, but a lot of the watermarks, Pentamenti, Inc., all of these things can be investigated by remote sensing. And the potential of remote sensing for me, if an artist drew on paper and erased it, you can't really see it by a photograph necessarily. You can't see it by your eye, but remote sensing immediately tracks that. So there are quite a lot of possibilities with remote sensing because it's basically a highly accurate photograph that goes into micro technology. Um, and that is definitely a potential that I see. You can use that for paintings. You know, was there something painted before? We can't see that. Of course, there are also other tools to investigate that. I'm very much aware. Um, but, but having that as an add-on to databases would actually be very helpful as well, I think. Great, thanks. And, and Reagan, given that you, I mean, you work tangentially with works on paper, but not so much about the materiality. Um, I wonder if, um, if that's ever played into the questions you want to ask, or if there are other more pressing ones that you find have come up in your work. Yeah, thank you. I think, yeah, these tools that you've discussed are very interesting. I think my, my investigation sort of shifts gears a little bit to think about so many uh, data visualization tools and so many digital tools are language based and that's something that it can do very well to read and recognize and sort of crunch language. Um, and so one thing that is, could definitely be an interesting avenue is thinking about things like artists contracts, whereas before they maybe have been studied only for specific well-known paintings or commissions, but to be able to read across an entire body of them and to pull out new uh, trends and information um, 
based on language. And I think that's a way that uh, the visual and the material would connect much faster than perhaps in my project. Um, but looking at paintings contracts will definitely include that language of material technique process. Great. And Liran, as I look at your, your database, at your, your wonderful kind of collection of um, kind of digital, do I dare say ephemera, I, I'm, I'm not that pessimistic, but, um, but at your collection, I wonder, are there questions that you would love to be able to ask of that material that, that the, the tools just aren't there yet? Or, yeah. Yeah, I think that um, if we think more generally about the discipline of art history, then what augmented reality in this context of art history, and especially in the context of museum and cultural heritage, allows us to do is to kind of expand the idea of what we understand as the art historical canon, and also this idea of, um, you know, the, the the chronological perception of history, because augmented reality and virtual reality and, and all those kinds of technologies that are facilitated within this context are basically relational. So that means we're inserting another date, another piece of information, more data into an already existing piece. And so that really allows us to expand how we interpret and bring in more frameworks for further interpretation. So in many museums and in many institutions, we see those technologies, especially augmented reality, currently being used as a new form of audio guide. And so the idea of the database is really to kind of like expose that and also showcase different and other forms of employing this technology to expand this idea of, you know, um, just reusing the new technology to do what we already did before. So we can really see projects in here that explore counterfactual histories and projects that really uh, bring in alternative discourses and alternative histories into the same context of what we have uh, been doing and, and seeing as a canon uh, so far. So I think this is uh, something that we'd like to see more of and, and I'm ha I hope uh, that this uh, database would encourage that. Wonderful. Um, I want to open the floor briefly for any of you to respond to the to the responses of, of your peers. I have a question about sort of digital archiving, I guess, um, with virtual reality being a relatively new technology and I'm sure changing rapidly, is it challenging to maintain these files in a readable way or how does that, how does that work? Are you asking me? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so um, this is a really, um, it's a complicated question to answer because it really depends on the platform, depends on the technology employed and also depends on how it's stored. Um, virtual reality is different from augmented reality. Um, so, and I can say that these are questions that institutions, uh, based on interviews that I've um, conducted with professionals in this field, these, these are questions that um, there, there are current challenges in this field. And um, another challenge that many institutions kind of consider is that we want to make those uh, engagements um, shared in many instances and virtual reality makes it more difficult um, because it's an individual experience uh, basically uh, with augmented reality this is more easily facilitated but still we have um, issues concerning you know the platform and if users at the most practical level need to download data onto their phones and they need to download an app or this is something that is cloud-based and these are all questions that institutions are considering and there's no one uh, answer to this so it really depends on the independent preferences of the institution um, what I did with this database, unfortunately, not to violate um, copyright, I couldn't um, upload the apps themselves. So what I did is basically those entries are uh, representations of those apps. So they include a lot of metadata, including uh, the um, uh, categorizations and the actual uh, types of technologies and frameworks used and videos. Um, and I also refer to sites and, and other um, um, bibliography to provide more information. So that's how I kind of went around this issue. Great. Great. Thank you so much. I want to just conclude with one quick question. Um, and that is, I'd like to hear maybe a one-liner um, answer from each of you about how 
this kind of work can be facilitated. So what kind of training do you think that the rising cohorts of art historians might need in order to advance digital art history? How can mentors or professional associations, uh, institutions help to make that happen? Um, it's the kind of last minute rapid fire brainstorm session. Could I just answer? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's basically what I did myself as well. I think uh, the cliche thing, of course, of today is uh, interdisciplinary research, but I'm uh, actually part of a U Create studio, so a computer lab space as well as a data center, as well as with the, the Department of Architecture and Art History. Uh, and I think that is absolutely crucial for the training of digital art history. You can't do it as a department on yourself. Uh, I believe you can, of course, disagree. That's, that's what I would say, yeah. Awesome, thanks, Nick. And if I can jump in, I would also agree. I gained most of my skills through an interdisciplinary uh, lab that was hosted in a library, graduate library. Um, but what I would add is that I think to many art historians who are unfamiliar with digital tools, it may seem very intimidating and they think they know, they have to know how to like code a computer from the ground up. And actually there are many very user-friendly tools now um, that is a great entryway into this kind of investigation. So that's a great place to start if you don't have the, the coding background. I, I agree with Reagan. Um, I have background in data analysis, but um, and, and I encounter this uh, among colleagues in my department all the time. People are concerned that some of these tools may not be accessible if you don't know how to code or if you don't have certain technical background. Um, but that's not true. Uh, many tools out there are free and accessible. And I have to admit that um, I taught um, a seminar on uh, digital art in this past winter semester and I included two uh, workshops for my students uh, kind of like introducing them to web VR and AR tools and I gave them the option to just use those tools to create a final project and they didn't have to but to my surprise uh, all of the students actually chose to use those tools and they had support on campus um, for any technical issues and questions they may had um, but uh, they used it and the results were really great so I guess just search for what's out there. All right, and last word goes to Elizabeth. Uh, well, from my personal experience, I would say uh, it's really helpful and important to reach out to and, and build relationships with conservators because they often are already on the front line of having to know and keep up to date with the latest technology as it relates to their field and whatever objects they study. And they just have a wealth of knowledge that's really Sadly, I think too often runs parallel to what art historians like in the academy are doing. And um, at least in my experience too, are very uh, generous with their time and knowledge and are excited to share that. And you just be surprised by how much it can change your perspective to look at the kinds of questions they ask, um, which usually had never you know, occurred to me. <laughs> That's great. Thank you all for, for a wonderful um, rapid fire presentation of your research. It was wonderful to hear about it. And, um, and, and thank you for your input in the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we only